So our first speaker is Shirley Wong from Princeton University, and I'll just hand it over. Thank you so much, Hannah. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to focus today more on the faculty development end of things, so more on teaching than on learning. But some of what I'll talk about are things that at our center, which is both the teaching and learning center, that we've discussed could also work for graduate students and also perhaps from the learning end. But again, I'll focus a little bit more on, on faculty and, and teaching today. So I'm just speaking today on behalf of a, a whole host of colleagues. Um, there are many more that um, I didn't mention, but I just wanted to highlight a few, some of whom are actually in this session right now. So, you know, first um, I wanted to just emphasize that, you know, we've done a lot of reflection, I'm sure as the rest of you have done over the course of the last year and the last couple of years. And just at a big picture level, um, you know, some of the challenges we see in terms of um, in having faculty engage with teaching or teaching related initiatives seems to be um, about sort of bandwidth and also just engagement. So some of this is a little bit perennial, you know, that we are a research institution. And so there's going to be a, a vari variability in terms of the amount of bandwidth and engagement um, faculty have with teaching. But in particular, we felt that over the course of the pandemic with everyone really um, in lots of ways focused on teaching that um, this year when we sort of came back that there was perhaps in some certain cases, some less uh, reduced bandwidth and engagement. So that was a challenge. At the same time, we felt there were many opportunities. And one of the things that we really felt that um, the last couple of years have taught us, and a lot of this is to do with technology, is that uh, faculty really appreciate flexibility and really seem to respond to that. And there are also new ways to connect, right? Again, a lot of this is technological, but not necessarily only technological. And also um, there are opportunities for us to think about how do we not only create initiatives or, or new things, but also to really try to build an evaluation and to try to uh, make sure that they um, are act actually working, that people appreciate them, you know, and, and sort of using that kind of feedback to guide future initiatives. So, you know, the title of the session was supposed to be about institutional transformation. I'm not claiming that these are about institutional, institutional transformation, but I think what we have tried to do is uh, think about initiatives that could live on and that could be enhanced compared to um, what they were before. And so in the interest of time, I'm just going to mention a couple of them today and just focus a, a little tiny bit on just one of them. But one, uh, one sort of approach that we have taken more recently, in the, I would say in the, in the second half of the year, actually is uh, to think about um, issuing more calls for proposals related to aspects of teaching. So specific aspects, they could be about um, digital uh, assignments or digital work. That's one call that we put out um, also on inclusive teaching. But the idea being that, <clears throat> that we, excuse me, try to um, sort of guide a little bit, you know, what we're hoping that faculty will want to be interested in, um, in implementing in their classes. And what we found is that faculty really seem to respond to these calls for proposals. They have included a bit of money, um, but not necessarily huge amounts. Um, and then and one of the things that we've also talked a lot about is that when we ask for these proposals and we get these really interesting ideas and things, you know, what do we want to do in terms of asking for them to engage with evaluation or output? And so that's something that we really want to include with our calls for proposals is to think about, um, you know, what would we like to see from faculty at the end? So sometimes it might be some sort of assessment or evaluation of the uh, the initiative or the, or the course itself, it might lend itself very well to that. And other times the output might be something like we have a new um, collection of teaching initi initiatives, I guess you would call it a blog, that was, is really meant to focus on classroom initiatives um, conducted at Princeton. And so perhaps an output we might want is for someone who's implementing an initiative to actually write a firsthand experience about what they've um, created and actually put it out publicly, at least for the Princeton community. So that's something we really try to do is kind of build in some kind of thinking about evaluation or, or product output um, along with the calls for proposal. And then the other thing I wanted to highlight today is something that you know, many of you might already do, but it's new to us, which is really trying to um, create more of a hybrid and a cohort design for some sorts of pedagogical sessions and materials. So in particular, um, at Princeton, we don't have a course design institute for, for faculty, and I know that many of you do, and I've actually been eyeing a lot of them, you know, um, uh, and what we thought would, could be really, really interesting is to really utilize 
um, the comfort that faculty now have with Canvas. Um, so at Princeton, we actually trans, uh, trans uh, went, went from Blackboard to Canvas during the pandemic. And as a result, the Canvas sort of transformation was very fast. And so faculty have really gotten used to using Canvas. And so we wanted to really think about using it as not only something that they use for their teaching with their students, but also that we could use as a way of um, supplementing or um, you know, helping with the faculty in terms of them not just coming to in-person live sessions, but thinking about how we could utilize Canvas to help design a, a hybrid course design institute. So again, many of you probably also are thinking or already have created something along these lines, but this is an idea that um, began actually uh, a while back. And one of our um, instructional designers, Kate Thorpe, actually began developing this last summer. And there is asynchronous contact content on Canvas and also asynchronous engagements. So it, which is really implemented a lot of active learning, but it, it's asynchronous. So it, for instance, it might be a Mentimeter poll. It might be a Google form where people have to do something. And I'll show you a couple of examples of this in, um, in closing. And then also we want to build in real-time community. So that might be via discussion groups, but we're also envisioning really live sessions. They would be voluntary, but perhaps, perhaps every eight weeks or so there'd be a cohort. And we would say that if you want to be involved in this live cohort, you know, they're gonna be, two Zoom sessions on either end or perhaps three with one in the middle, something like that, so that there would be sort of a cohort effect, but also there would be this flexibility that these materials would be accessible. Um, and even if you do it asynchronously, there's still engagement opportunities. And we're gonna be piloting this um, this summer with the idea that hopefully this will be, again, maybe not institutional transformation, but something that will live on in the future. And then we can build upon that with other kinds of pedagogical sessions as well. So I just want to show you um, a couple of um, screenshots and then I'll, uh, I'll let others speak. And so this is just sort of the, um, the introduction of the, the course, which is sort of laying out this sort of backwards design um, idea. And then uh, there are a whole host of modules, as you can imagine, that faculty can go through either in, in its entirety or they can skip to certain ones. And then I just want to show you an example of what um, Kate has called planning pause. But these are these engagement tools where people can do it asynchronously, but also there can be further engagement after that. So they would just sort of fill out on their own. Um, you know, this in this case, it's about brainstorming course goals and reflecting on them. The, their responses get emailed straight to them. But also, if they wanted, we could give them feedback. And we could also think about creating a group or cohort um, experience where they could give each other feedback. But again, it sort of gives flexibility in terms of timing and also the amount of interaction that people want. So on that note, thank you for listening. I know that we're gonna be holding questions till the end. So we'll do that. And then also, um, if you have further questions after that, I'm happy to um, answer broad questions. And then if there's specific questions about the Course Design Institute, my colleague Kate, I'm sure would be very happy to answer questions there. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for sharing. That was wonderful. So our next speaker is Bruce Linthal from the University of Pennsylvania, and I'll just hand it over to him. Thank you all. It's, it's good to see you, uh, and I'm delighted to have a chance to talk with you all. Uh, our session is called a deep dive, but I will be very upfront that what I am going to attempt is a shallow one. Uh, uh, trying to capture even some of the lessons and directions of the past two years in a couple of minutes is obviously impossible, uh, but I want to talk about it at least thinking about some of the phases and uh, we've had in thinking about our pedagogical challenges at the University of Pennsylvania and in the Center for Teaching and Learning here over those years uh, and think about a little bit of how we've tried to understand those pedagogical challenges and so that we can think about how we address them. And I think so that we can all think about some lessons that we may have learned from that. Uh, I'm gonna stress that the lessons that I'm gonna talk about are specific to Penn students in our situation, which is residential undergraduates, chiefly, that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I imagine for many of you, this is going to resonate, but for some of you, uh, this may not. Uh, I really want to speak to three moments of pandemic teaching uh, and how, as I said, Penn Center for Teaching and Learning is trying to learn from them. And I'll touch on three to three approaches there. Uh, and, and then the lessons will confront from that and where we that leads us. Uh, I suspect we'll all see some recurring themes. Uh, the three phases I want to hit are the planned remote teaching, fall of 2020 through spring of 2021, 
they returned to in-person teaching amidst a bunch of heat upheavals fall of 2021 to spring of 2022, I hope. Uh, and then looking forward in to something that's largely in-person now. I'm not gonna talk about the uh, transition to, to emergency remote teaching in 2020. Uh, what I wanna talk about here is, is this moment when we were all, or many of us were offering a huge amount of support for online re remote teaching in a pandemic. Uh, and what Penn did, we did a number of surveys of our students, uh, particularly in that fall of 2020. And uh, here you can see one of the questions we asked, well, what are characteristics of your best working class and characteristics of your class working least well? Uh, and again, keep in mind, these are students in a pandemic and students who didn't want to be online. Uh, but what I can point you to is it's a one to five scale, I should note. A uh, couple of takeaways of notes across the board, the best working classes score higher than the least well working classes. You can see I uh, called out the my classmates says that treat me as a peer, which is top in the classes working least well, but you know, the bottom and best working, but still better, although that's the one that's closest. Uh, some of what you see here is not surprising. Good classes are clear and organized. Students know what they need to know. They know what, where to find resources. They understand the class purpose. But some of the other things that I wanna call out for our attention are really about belonging and the relationship between students and instructors. Uh, you can see that an approachable instructor becomes really important for the students. Instructors that welcome questions, uh, that's one of the biggest differences, whether they're students feel comfortable asking questions uh, and instructors have faith in students. So that's uh, that students can be successful. And I think that's an important thing for us to think about uh, as, we're, as we're imagining some of these lessons. If we dig a little more deeply, uh, here are some of the elements that students identified in their top best working classes and in their classes working least well. Uh, these, are, these are, I just grabbed the top eight uh, that students identified. Uh, the biggest difference I'll call attention to in good classes, classes that work well is an accessible instructor. You can see that it shows up very rarely in the classes that aren't working well. Uh, you can also see a big difference in using synchronous class times for discussion. Uh, I think it's important that this data is really reinforcing the notion of the importance of building relationships and community. Again, that's not going to come as a surprise to any of you, but I think it's an important thing for us to reinforce. We could unpack this further. Uh, we also asked students said, I'm not going to get into it here, but which of these elements was most important for the success of courses? And I think that's significant because you can see something like recorded lectures showing up in, in both these categories. And what it turns out when you ask what's most important is it's obviously not enough for something to be present. It's a, it's got to be uh, used well as, as, as well. Uh, jumping ahead to uh, the fall of 2021, uh, when we were returning to in-person class and hoping we were returning to normal in-person classes, what we discovered, of course, like all of you, I suspect, is that we were not returning to anything normal. Faculty and students were still very uneasy. They had no idea how long these classes would be in-person versus online. Uh, people felt at risk and were at risk for getting sick. Many students particularly were, were still living through a period of trauma. And so like many of you, I suspect, the watchword on our campus for teaching in that last fall was flexibility. And we created an array of programs and materials on flexibility, helping students who had to miss class. Uh, how do you teach students who are experiencing trauma and anxiety? Uh, what we discovered through that fall, and I, again, like I suspect many of you, was that flexibility wasn't enough. We also needed a high degree of structure for our students. Uh, this didn't come from surveys, but it come, came from talking to faculty and advisors about where students were crashing. Students needed deadlines and expectations, not at the expense of flexibility, but in conjunction with it to help them know how to stay on track, to know what the desired track was, to keep students from falling too far behind. Uh, and I think this is important in thinking about a reminder that structure and flexibility are not, in fact, oppositional, as they're so often cast. Uh, but they are reinforcing of one another. And if we value compassionate teaching, it requires both. Um, and this brings me to our current moment. Uh, lots of us wanna ask, and indeed we're asking this in, uh, explicitly in this conversation, in this conference, uh, what we've been learning for the past two years and what we want to carry forward. And I think that's a, a, a really good question to be asking, but I wanna suggest another formulation to that, uh, that uh, that's also important for us, I believe, and that is, what makes being in class in person so meaningful? 
because I'm going to suggest that if we can figure that out, if we can figure out how to answer that question, we can really think about what are the strategies that best support it. And we may then know what we want to take from or build on for the going forward. And that's, I think, true regardless of the modality of our teaching. Last month, we had a faculty student conversation on this very topic, asking faculty and students to talk with one another about this the question of what makes it meaningful. Uh, and the, the, the students and faculty raised an array of great points. Uh, some, some folks talked about the importance of space itself conveying a meaning. Uh, if any of you are students of Adorno or sacred and profane or sacred space, you know that you're going to say, well, of course, space conveys a meaning that you're supposed to behave or engage in a certain way. Uh, students, people talked about the importance of reading one another, the possibilities of depth of communication, using the phrase interestingly, but more bandwidth when you're in person uh, to see to see who's, lo who's lost or enthralled. People talked about tactile learning and physical engagement with stuff or moving around. People talked about the serendipity of accidental encounters, accidental engagements. But the key idea that folks came back to again and again in this conversation was that classes and classrooms are both social and intellectual spaces, and that those two concepts are utterly inseparable, that we can't treat them as, as separate practices, but they are most nicely welded together. Students talked to us about the social excitement of engaging with friends, being an integral part of and fueling the intellectual excitement. Uh, students talked about the difference between going to class alone and going to class with others. And that's how they talked about being online. Uh, and the goal that emerged here is not just helping students build understandings, but helping students build an excitement for the process of understanding. And for that, for learning from and with one another, building community isn't just a bonus, it's not just an add-on, it is at the core of the experience. Uh, and if that idea that we heard in this one faculty student conversation is right, and based on some of the data I shared around some of the keys to remote teaching, I think we have some more evidence that it is, if that value is right, then I think we have some guidance and some values to help us think about the teaching strategies we want to develop, and build on from these two years as we go forward. Thanks so much. I'm happy to hand this off to our next speaker. Great, thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Ruth Paprosky from the University of Georgia. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, as she said, I'm Ruth Paprosky. I am Associate Director in our Center for Teaching and Learning here at UGA. Um, I'm gonna do something a little bit different. I'm gonna share with you um, sort of an example of something that has started um, so a few different strands that have kind of come together pre-pandemic and through the pandemic to a place now that's really impacting um, sort of larger institutional change here at UGA. So um, back in 2018, <clears throat> with some money from the president of the university, the Center for Teaching and Learning put together uh, um, an intensive course redesign institute called the Active um, Learning Summer Institute which is really focused on helping people incorporate active learning effectively into their courses. And during that, there were two sessions in particular that really resonated with the participants. One was about um, situational factors. So the sort of contextual factors that impact what you do and what you can do in your class. And the other was about stages of student development. And so out of this uh, came a faculty learning community that kind of wanted to further explore a lot of these things. And some um, people from the Center for Teaching and Learning were involved, as well as a variety of other people. And, um, and then they started working on building a tool to help people select active learning techniques, which um, then went on past the learning um, community. And it really became a true partnership between the Center for Teaching and Learning, faculty, student affairs, and then others also in other units around campus. And the result, um, is it well, and then beyond that, to sort of finally finish it, um, someone was able to take a group of students who were doing a capstone project. And so completing the tool for us became their project. So they're able to kind of treat us as clients and, and work on it and finish it. So I'm gonna share it with you and then talk a little bit more about it. Um, I think I will, you know what, I'm gonna hold off on giving you the link so you can listen to me and then get distracted by it later. Um, so let me just share my screen. 
Um, this is our um, salt tool. So you want to put a little salt on it, select your active learning technique. And um, the, there's a little bit of text here and some background and some instructions on how to use salt. But the key here is in the air table that was built. So when you're here, you want to view the larger version and that will show you this here. And the great thing about this is that, you know, when you just look at it, you're like, okay, I don't know what that is, Ruth. Well, I'm going to tell you. Um, each of these cards is its own active learning technique. And there's all kinds of stuff in here. I think I'm going to pull up dotocracy so that we can look at it a little more carefully. Each one has a description. It tells you kind of what kind of activity is. This one is a group activity, the class sizes that it'll work best for, um, the room type that it's going to work for, and also looks at Bloom's taxonomy in terms of the sorts of types of cognitive activity it connects with, as well as stages of student development. And if you go back to the other um, the original page that I showed you, there's some more information about stages of student development. And there's a variety of different things here. It tells you how much time it might take, how much time you might need to debrief. And there's tags. You can even um, just grab a PDF of it. So every activity has this information in it. But let me tell you, the real power of this is the filter. So the filter allows you to say, well, what kind of class? am I teaching? What kind of room am I in? So you might take your class size, you might take your room type. You might be thinking about this type of um, stages of, of student development or um, the part of Bloom's taxonomy, sort of the cognitive development, all the rest of it. You might even be thinking about the amount of time that you wanna be able to um, give to something like this. So this is sort of the tool that was developed and it's actually, um, been used while well, we've been promoting it a little bit with our faculty and so we've had people using it in their courses we've also had people using it um, to help train their peer learning assistants for undergraduate classes to help them sort of um, understand why their faculty might be selecting the kinds of activities they are and how they might work the other thing i'm back now to the original page um, there's an option to submit techniques and also submit ratings and so our goal is that this can have um, wider spread impact and that it'll become sort of a crowdsourced tool that we will it will continue to grow over time. Um, we know that there are others at other schools that have started using it. Um, and the other thing is that all of the work with our Active Learning Summer Institute, as well as developing this tool and a few other things have led to um, UGA adopting our quality enhancement plan, which is a five to 10 year strategic plan to a strategic initiative to impact um, undergraduate education is all about active learning. And so this will also become a big part of how we help provide um, tools asynchronously to faculty as we continue with the other parts of our, our work on active learning. So I will um, leave it at that for now. I'll put the link in the chat um, and happy to take questions later. Thank you. Thank you. That's really awesome. Um, I'm so excited to look further at it. Um, so our final speakers today are Caitlin Hayward and Deb Meislish from the University of Michigan, and I will hand it over to them. So good morning. Uh, my name is Deb Meislish and Kate Hayward and I are pleased to be here to give you um, an update from our campus. We together represent provost office units with really broad reach and a range of partnerships across our very decentralized university. Um, we titled our presentation with these two questions. What are you holding on to and what are you letting go of? Because we found them to be fruitful ways to open conversations about the teaching and learning lessons from this pandemic moment. So we wanted to start by noting a stark convergence of transformational forces on our campus. On January 5th of 2022, Michigan opened a new classroom building. It's pictured here. Um, in physical form, it embodies many of the important trends in pre-pandemic higher education. Its classrooms were designed with active and team-based learning and with active and team-based learning in mind, and they were scaled so that faculty could bring together large numbers of students together um, in purpose-built spaces that could support those types of pedagogies. That same day, the Michigan Daily our student newspaper featured a cartoon with this headline, Episode 2, Omicron Strikes Back. I think that captures a lot of the things that all of us on many campuses were dealing with. 
But this convergence meant that the first faculty to teach in this building were navigating, on the one hand, how to best take advantage of these classrooms, while on the other, providing flexibility and access for students who could not physically attend class because they were quarantining from or concerned about COVID. And at times it was a bumpy ride. Instructors wondered, was it enough to just record class for absent students to view asynchronously? Or should students be given an option to attend remotely in real time? If students could zoom in, was it enough to have students participate alone in any activities that were planned? Or did each class session require the instructor to design lessons that would work equally well in Zoom and in person? Faculty tried many different approaches, but many found the situation really challenging and unsatisfying. So where do we go from here? So clearly the task is figuring out how to navigate all of these issues. Um, one way in which we've been doing this is to leverage as many strategies as we can. So some of those involve building on existing efforts. Other involve new ways to listen to our communities as we work to adjust the programs we offer and the learning tools that are available on our campus. And so we're gonna share just a little bit about both of those. So one important strategy for us has been to bring faculty communities together to process all that has happened and to reflect on their instructional choices in this new era. And that echoes some of the things we've heard from others. For example, working with our largest undergraduate college, Literature, Sciences and Arts, we repurposed an existing large course initiative in order to do this. And we asked questions like, so what is class time for? Echoing the, the uh, prompt that Bruce uh, mentioned before. What does student engagement look like? What is equitable assessment? And similar communities were launched in our College of Engineering as those faculty wrestled with similar questions. Another important new approach emerged from Michigan's existing foundational course initiative, which partners CRLT consultants with departmental teams to redesign large foundational courses. In the fall of 2020, Dr. Carla, Carly Nowicki, an instructor with Bio 173, became really deeply concerned about her students' well being, and she wanted to develop a process to check in on her over 700 students in the class. She asked her FCI partners for help in doing this because this is a really big task. Um, the work led to a partnership with Wolverine Wellness, which is a division of our um, University Health Service, to implement a scalable process for course based student wellness checks that went beyond resource sharing. And I think that's really important. They created a short survey that specifically asked students whether they needed anyone to reach out to them about either course or well being concerns. If students requested help, those requests were routed to either the instructional team of Bio 173 or to the Wolverine Wellness team for follow up. After piloting this in a large in this large biology course, they've been working to expand it to other large foundational courses involved in the, the initiative. A related example, our colleagues at CRLT and engineering created an educational module based on mindset research that was conducted both prior to and during the pandemic by our, our engineering professors Joanna Milinchuk and Cynthia Finelli. The module teaches students how positive framing can help students succeed in engineering. Students in the module have opportunities to practice strategies for adopting such framing attitudes and contribute advice to help other engineering students do the same. The College of Engineering is working to get this module into student hands through communication with faculty, with academic advisors, and directly to students. So for a bit more on some things happening at U of M, I'm going to turn things over to Kate. Thanks so much, Deb. So determining our approach is, is still very much a work in progress, as, as we've heard broadly across institutions today. We're asking questions about what we need to prepare people for and, and what evidence we need to select different approaches. And at a place like ours, it, it will not be just one approach. It will be many. And so being informed about the range of things has been crucial. There's very much a sense that we're building this plane as we're flying it and that it's key to make the best decisions we can, but also study outcomes and iterate when we find that things can be improved. We've been intentional, as others have, about listening to the community. 
there have been many, many surveys. A few examples, we have conducted a survey with faculty about the future of online learning on our campus with really divergent opinions about what that could and should look like. We've surveyed graduate students about mental health effects that they've faced in the pandemic and how they're experiencing degree delays. We've spoken to undergraduates about the strengths and the weaknesses of virtual advising experiences, what physical and financial challenges they have faced, and how their career goals may have been shaped by this moment. Asking questions and listening to the answers, even and especially when they've surprised us, has been core to helping us design the path forward. One example of how we've taken steps to prepare our community has been reimagining our teaching assistant orientation. This traditionally in-person two-day event became a virtual async experience in the lead up to fall 2020. And amazingly, was able to reach even more students than ever before the change of modality. Before completing the modules, the soon to be teaching assistants rated themselves collectively as 37% prepared for the semester ahead. And after that rose to 89%. We've continued to iterate this experience based on feedback we got from this community, including adding a virtual but still but synchronous remote teaching practice to offer, offer safe ways to practice teaching skills, get feedback, and build community. We have also seen an increase in demand for technology to address the different challenges, and we're working to refine our pedagogy and our evidence about which of these works and in what contexts. Certainly, there are many technologies emerging for the in-class space. Michigan has made a very specific and intentional decision not to engage in proctoring technology, and that has yielded a broad conversation about effective assessment in online learning environments. We're also seeing growing awareness, and I think this is particularly for the semester ahead, that students on campus life has been deeply affected and disrupted by the last two years. And we're starting to explore technology like RARA to support intentional engagement on campus. And finally, as examples of technology that existed prior to the pandemic, but have made it possible to address emerging challenges in this moment, these are four platforms that are built at the Center for Academic Innovation that I wanted to give a tiny glimpse into. eCoach supports students with personalized, tiny, timely information to help them succeed in their classes. And research over the last two years has revealed that small email nudges in high stakes courses can help students do their best. Gradecraft is a learning management system that has proven to be well-designed for a moment where we want to hold ourselves to high standards in teaching while also offering that flexibility, respect, and structure. Tandem teaches teamwork and has been particularly valuable to instructors trying to evaluate how teams are doing in their courses without being able to observe those teams directly. And we have seen a tremendous surge in learners enrolling in MOOCs, including students using Michigan Online to support their formal coursework and their career development. These are just a few of the many efforts across the UM campus to design what excellent education looks like in our new normal. Thanks for listening and thank you so much to all of the co-presenters for sharing such inspiring glimpses of their work. Thank you both um, for sharing that with us. And thank you again to all the speakers for sharing your wonderful ideas. Um, so now we have a good amount of time for questions. So if you have any questions, if you're in Zoom, please feel free to raise your hand um, virtually and I'll call on you or feel free to post them in either the chat in Zoom or the chat in Whova. And I actually do see a question in the Whova chat. Um, for Deb and Kate, which is, um, is it possible to access the engineering module that um, was in the, your presentation? If so, how can someone do that? So I don't believe it's shareable outside of the University of Michigan at this point, but I would point you to my colleagues at the um, Center for Research and Learning and Teaching's in, uh, engineering office, and I will put the specific contact name in the chat for you. Great, thank you. Um, and. There is a question um, in the chat for Bruce. Um, um, I will read it aloud just so everyone can hear it. Um, I too am a teaching center staff member, UMN, and I have a question for Bruce and all of us really. I was nine right along with you when you were explaining that in-person classes and classrooms are social spaces, but I wondered about the ambivalence of those spaces. In other words, in-person social spaces are also spaces where microaggressions occur. For example, did this idea come up in the faculty um, student conversation at all? 
how are we thinking about the effects of return to in-person teaching on BIPOC students and LGBTQ students specifically in these political times? I, I, obviously, that is an excellent question. It's something we need to be considering about any time we're talking about something being a social engagement uh, and or any time we're talking about human beings being together, frankly. Uh, what I will say is the short answer is no, that did not come up in our conversation, uh, but I can offer a couple of reflections from other conversations that, that may shed some light on it. Uh, the first is that I think when we shouldn't posit this as something that uh, one group is inherently opposed to and one group is inherently supportive of, I think we have lots of students of, from lots of different backgrounds who uh, feel a need for an intellectual and social engagement hand in hand. Uh, so I think that's a, the first thing, first thing to say. But the second thing I wanna say is, it's absolutely true that these spaces are fraught in different ways for different folks. And we need to be mindful of this. And this exists independently of whether or not we're, we're coming off a pandemic. And one of the things that our faculty often say, we have a whole slew of other conversations with faculty about how do you create an inclusive classroom? And they often say, everything you're talking about doing to make things seem more welcoming is scary because there's space for me to get it wrong and mess it up. And if I don't put any effort, if I just lecture, then I'm not gonna get anything wrong. Uh, and of course, we know what happens if you do that. We know that what happens is then you can leave lots of people out. Uh, all of this is a, is a lengthy way of saying that I think one of the things we have to embrace is the possibility that this is hard and the possibility that we're gonna make mistakes uh, because that's the way we're going to to do a better job. And we know that for all of our students, getting them intellectually excited what makes a difference. And that there's that social component too. And, uh, and I guess what I'm saying is we, we can't run from, from the difficulty, but we have to acknowledge it and look it squarely in the face. We have some more questions coming into the chat, but I just wanted to check with the rest of our panel today to see if anyone wanted to add anything on to Bruce's answer. Great. Okay, so uh, we have a question from Hoover. Um, with all this technology, uh, how were students trained about so many resources being available yet avoiding information overload? And this is just a general question that um, isn't directed at anyone in particular. I'll say that I think that's something we're still really figuring out best practices around. It really very much lives in the classroom at the moment, right? Um, individuals and instructors deciding how they wanna frame technology, what role it plays in their space. And so I think a, a core goal for us is figuring out how to help have those resources at hand um, for instructors to easily be able to customize and share and make accessible. Um, and also helping call out the places where students actually need to, uh, and this is this is a real challenge for them that we have to acknowledge. We use them so differently in some spaces that helping them recognize that at the beginning can be really paramount to their success. So real challenges at, at, from somebody who studies information. I can add to Caitlin's answer just to say that I think this is part of the reason that we want to really call the amount of technologies we're offering students and not offer everything. And that's also true because our faculty can't have too many choices. And it's also true because there's a limit to what our technical uh, support folks can support. So I, I think that you know, we're still gonna have lots of different uh, mix, but there's an institutional need to be really thoughtful about what we put in the mix. And I'll just add that we also um, have been talking a lot about um, potentially de-emphasizing technology itself and being really thoughtful about the pedagogy and so it's the technology enhances the pedagogy but the technology doesn't drive sort of the, the way that the teaching goes and sometimes it's really tempting to kind of um, be like oh there's this neat tool that we can use to facilitate facilitate student engagement you know but are there actually is that is it really needed or are there other ways maybe even better ways you know old-fashioned if not you know that that might work as well so we we think very we're trying to think very carefully about that whenever we talk about new technologies
Great. Um, we have a few more questions coming in via the Zoom chat. Um, thank you all for your great presentations. What are the conversations on the future of hybrid learning on your campuses looking like right now? I'll just jump in for a second. So I think that that's, um, there's a lot of conversations happening about that in a lot of spaces. And some of it depends on how you define hybrid. Um, so I think if you define hybrid as courses that will have um, some online components and some uh, in person components, I think there's a lot of different ways in which people are thinking about and experimenting with that. And it's going to be fascinating to see sort of how these different um, ways of combining things come into being. Um, I think the other way in which you can think about it is kind of the, the standard high flux definition of things happening simultaneously in person and online. And we've certainly heard from instructors on our campus that that is not a happy space for many of them. Um, it's not something that they want. It's something they find really challenging. Um, and so, you know, this poses really important questions. Um, I saw another question here about, can you ask for an accommodation to not attend an in-person class in person? And can you do it online? And I think those, you know, those things all intersect with each other. Um, what are we asking of students? What do students, or what are we asking of instructors? What do students need? How do we put all of these things together? And I don't think we have any, um, we don't have any final answers to this. This is part of what I think we're going to be continuing to navigate as we go into next year, um, perhaps with the hope that there's a little bit more clarity, maybe by the end of the summer about uh, about the sort of range of options and choices that um, that people can make. Deb, I completely agree. And I'm just curious, um, do any of you actually have policies uh, for um, accommodation or sort of the simultaneous hybrid. So I think that question about, um, you know, even if it's, if it's mental health or something else, right? Like I just can't come, why can't I get a link? You know, uh, I'm just really curious if anyone actually has tried to tackle that more systemically. I don't know if I could just jump in, but um, if it's okay, I will. Um, I'm uh, responding from Duke and right now, and I think this is a question I'm particularly interested in because we have no formal, no university accommodations that allow a student to do this, to say, okay, I've got a mental physical health need that, that requires me to be remote. But what we've done this spring, and I think we've really gotten ourselves into a weird place, is that we have kind of informally allowed students to ask professors if they can do this which has put professors in a really awkward position because then they're either um, feeling like if they don't allow this, they're really not being empathetic and flexible to the students' needs. And, and that's a message we've been putting out all during the pandemic, be attentive, take care of the students, be empathetic. But at the same time, it's really wreaking havoc with kind of setting a standard approach to this and allowing them to control their classroom and their pedagogy in the way that would be best for the course. So. That's why we're sort of curious to see whether other people are trying to figure out a formal approach to this and if they've made any progress in that space. Did any of our panelists want to add anything else about um, hybrid learning and its future or um, questions about like accommodations and mental health? I'll just add on hybrid learning or hybrid high flex and Deb is comments were excellent and spot on that we have to define what we mean because it means everything uh, that this is why I think we all have to step back and ask what are we actually trying to do not what can we do uh, and because what we can do may or may not align with what we are trying to do but starting with that conversation of what we want our, our learning experiences to be is I think really important for us at this moment and I'll add that I think it picks up on Bruce's earlier notes about structure and flexibility. Um, if you provide a link from the beginning, then a certain subset of students are going to choose not to attend in person, right? Um, that changes the in-classroom environment. That then has these, you know, scout the waterfall impact, right? And so on the other hand, if you say no, which is perceived as, as mean or not inclusive or not supportive then a certain group of students are excluded from the potential of that experience. And so how we balance that tension, I just think we're gonna have to keep coming back to and figuring out what we're trying to do. 
I think also um, Doug James put in the chat about moving from language about flexible to flexible with boundaries. And I, I do think this idea of flexibility maybe needs a little more investigation to figure out what, how do you present something flex so that students see the flexibility while you're also have the right constraints in place. Um, I think we're kind of at a nice point to be investigating that question and really figuring out what the best practices are there that will help both instructors and students. Um, because flexibility tends to come with a lot of extra work. And so what are the ways we can do it efficiently and effectively that also help the students um, see that they are being cared for, their interests are being taken into account. Also the um, clarifying the priorities of, sort of, are you looking for the ideal uh, learning experience or um, is perhaps Again, flexibility, inclusivity, you know, what, what sort of the priority? Because I think to, to your um, survey, Bruce, you know, there clearly seem to be benefits of being in the classroom. Now, of course, that will change based on, you know, context, all that stuff. But, but it certainly seems like that classroom space really is important. And at Princeton, cert certainly there's a great focus on being in person. You know, that's really important. Um, but, you know, I think the priority is based on this idea that you know the classroom learning is really this ideal learning environment, and and I could imagine there would be contexts where that maybe isn't isn't the case, or there might be other factors that take priority. I was just going to jump in. I saw the question from uh, I guess Doug James uh, from UNC Chapel Hill, um, and one of the interesting things about this new building that got opened at Michigan is that the the rooms are pretty technologically sophisticated, and so they have built in ability to record. Um, at least what the instructor is doing in the classroom, but some ability to move cameras around. They have a second dedicated Zoom camera in them. Um, and so even the technology that was available made it possible for students to ask for things that in some other space they might not have been able to ask for in the same way or might not have been able to be provided in the same way. So I think that's another sort of element of this and conversations that I've been having with instructors. Um, I've often sort of said, can we go back to first principles? There's all we've always had to ask the question, if a student needs to miss class, how do we keep them connected with the course and engaged with the material and with their peers? And so it, if we start with that question, what are the options that we have and how do those connect with the individual goals? And sometimes it's been helpful to kind of pull back a little bit and to sort of start with that question. It doesn't touch on like all the many institutional questions that are being posed here, but sometimes in at least in individual consulting and work, it can be helpful to, to at least help people make decisions about the, the options that they have. We are right at time. Um, so I did want to just check with our panelists for one final moment to see if anyone wanted to share any final thoughts. But thank you all in the audience for your engagement um, in the chat and your wonderful questions. Um, so um, it would any any of our panelists like to um, say a final word or great. Um, thank you all so much for sharing your ideas with us. Thank you again. Thank you again for the engagement. We are at time. Um, if you have any additional questions, however, um, or would like to continue this discussion, which it seems like this is something very important to um, everyone here, you can contact all today's speakers through the messaging feature on Whova. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers once again um, for sharing their work with us, and thank you all for attending today's symposium. I hope you enjoy the rest of the event.